Hi, I'm Matt Lupoli, and welcome to Percussion 101 with Mr. Lupoli. Hey everybody, Mr. Loopley here, and welcome back for another episode of Percussion 101 with Mr. Loopley. On this episode, we'll be talking all about hand drums. Now, if you remember, on the last episode, we talked all about the drum kit, and we talked about all the drums that are featured in the drum kit. They are all drums that are hit with sticks mallets, brushes, or pretty much any other kind of percussion utensil you can pretty much get your hands on. But hand drums, as the name implies, means that these drums are played with your bare hands. And hand drums are far older than any kind of drums that were designed to be played with sticks and mallets. Uh, and you can find hand drums in just about every culture in the world. You will find hand drums in Native American cultures, African cultures, Latin America, Asia, the Middle East. And we even have evidence that hand drums have existed uh, even since ancient times. In civilizations such as ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, we see evidence that they had hand drums even back then. Okay, so the very first category of hand drums I want to discuss is known as the frame drums, meaning that these drums are made from a very simple, thin frame of wood and some type of a drum head. So the first I'd like to talk about, and one of the oldest, is the tambourine. So the tambourine is a very old frame drum, a very old percussion instrument, um, and we see that it is actually... Uh, it dates back to thousands of years ago. We see in artwork um, from ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Greece, the ancient Romans, the ancient Israelites. We see in a lot of their pottery and their paintings, we see uh, people depicted playing tambourines. So we know they are very old. It's a very old design, so simple, but it, it worked great because we're still using tambourines so many years later. Uh, traditionally, it was actually used for more religious purposes. Um, and in pagan religions, in the ancient Hebrew religion, it was used sort of as an offering to either God, or if you were a pagan, to the gods, uh, used in various psalms and religious practices. And then eventually it started to be used in more secular music, so music that's not religious. So. As you can see, it's a very simple design. It's a very thin, uh, very thin wooden frame uh, with a drum head on it, and you also have some jingles on the side to enhance its sort of sound. So this is a more traditional style uh, tambourine because this one actually uses an animal skin head. The more traditional ones used animal skins. Uh, could be goat skin, sheep skin. This particular one has a calf skin on it. So you hold it in one hand, on the side of the frame, if so, and then with your fingers, just tap on the drum head. And there are all different kinds of taps you can use. You can tap different parts of the head. You can use your fingertips, the fleshy part of your hand, to get different sounds. So with a flick of your wrist, you can shake it to get that nice jingle sound. And you can kind of combine the two. You can use a lot of contact playing and use a lot of shaking with your wrist. You 
can also even turn it upside down and use your knee. between your knee and your fist. Uh, there's another cool little thing you can do which is known as the thumb roll. So before I started videotaping this, what I did was I took a bar of this. It almost looks like a little bar of soap. This is actually beeswax. So beeswax, you actually take a bar of it like this and you rub it onto the head of the tambourine. So what this is gonna do is going to give it a little bit of more, a little bit more friction on the surface of the drum head. So now all you do is just take your thumb and you lick it a little bit with your tongue, and then you get this really cool finger roll effect. There are many different styles of tambourines. I also have another one right here. This one, instead of being uh, made from an animal skin head, this has a synthetic plastic head, and this one is actually tunable, so you're gonna get some different tones with this one. Yeah, and they all, yeah, come in all different sizes and made from all different materials. There are even some tambourines, as you can see, that have no head at all. But we'll be talking about those in another episode. All right, next I'd like to talk about what is thought of as the cousin of the tambourine, and that would be this guy, the pandero. Um, so the pandero is an instrument that comes from Brazil. Um, so in case you don't know, Brazil is the only country in South America where Spanish is not the primary language. That would be Portuguese. So all the other South American countries were settled by the Spanish. Brazil was settled by the Portuguese. And when the Portuguese were colonizing Brazil, uh, it's believed that they brought the ideas for the pandero with them. So... A lot of people, when they see this for the first time, they just think, oh, it's just a, it's a tambourine, a larger tambourine. But there are actually quite a few differences. So if you notice, yes, it is a little bit larger than the tambourine. One thing I also want to mention is the jingles. So the tambourine, every time you see a jingle, there's actually two sets of small jingles. Whereas with the pandero, every time you see the jingles, there's only one set. And they're much larger. It's a much uh, larger style jingle. It's going to have a different sound, a different timbre. Um, and overall, the pandero, you just get a, a crisper, drier, and less sustained sound than the tambourine. You also would not play it exactly like a tambourine. You would not play a pandero like this. All right, now that may be acceptable to play a tambourine like that. But if you went to Brazil and started playing a pandero like that, they would look at you very funny. No, it's much more, uh, it's played much more like a drum. So like when we say that this is a type of frame drum, they mean drum. They want you to play it like a drum. Just think of it as a drum with jingles on it. So you're gonna be using a lot more action with your hands. And every part of your hand, you're gonna be using your fingertips. You're gonna be using your palm, the fleshy part of your hand, just every part of your hand and every part of the drum head surface. of Brazilian instruments uh, I have another one right here this one is a type of friction drum that we call a cuica okay so uh, as I mentioned cuica is another type of Brazilian instrument and that word cuica is actually Portuguese uh, when the Portuguese first settled in Brazil one of the 
new animals that they discovered was called the, uh, the gray four-eyed opossum. Now that's the name for it in English, but when the Portuguese settlers first saw this creature, they gave it the name Quica. And one thing they noted about it was that it had a very high pitched cry. So eventually when this instrument was designed and invented, um, it also had a very high pitched cry. So they gave it the same name, Quica. Um, now the origins of the Quica uh, is that it's probably African in origin. Uh, Brazil, like many other New World colonies, also had the slave trade. And uh, one of the ethnic groups of slaves that came to Brazil was known as the Bantu. Uh, the Bantu people were an ethnic group that came from Central Africa, uh, probably near uh, a country in the present day that is called Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and it's believed that they also made friction drums just like this. But they weren't always for music. They were actually for hunting. Uh, they made a design for a drum just like this that would make a sound that was very high pitched to sound like a female lioness. And they would do this sort of as like a, a hunter's call. They were trying to attract a male lion so that way uh, they could kill it. But over time, these friction drums were actually used in musical settings. And today it is actually a popular instrument that is used in samba music, which is a very popular musical style in Brazil. So when I say friction drum, I mean that it is not actually played by striking your hand. It is technically considered a hand drum because you're using your hands, you're not using any sticks, but you're not actually, you're not actually striking the drum. Now you'll notice there is something in the center of the head. So what they actually did here was they actually poked a hole in the center of the drum head and they inserted a sort of little thin bamboo stick. Now the cuica is open-ended. There is no uh, head on the other end and you can actually see inside and you can see that little bamboo stick. So what you're gonna do is you're actually gonna take uh, a wet cloth or a wet sponge like this one and you're actually gonna rub it up and down that little bamboo stick to get all the different sounds. So mine actually has a little shoulder strap, so I'm gonna go ahead and put that on. And as you rub that little sponge or wet cloth back and forth, you'll get sounds like this. Now, what do you do with your other hand? If you actually use this hand to press on the drum head, you can actually change the tone of that sound. See, now it's a much higher pitch. outside of the traditional samba music would be in the film score for the film Planet of the Apes. Uh, it, on a personal note, Planet of the Apes is actually one of my favorite movies, and the film composer on that film was the uh, Jerry Goldsmith, who's one of the best film composers that ever lived, and uh, he did something very interesting. He decided to insert the sounds of the cuica into the film score because he thought it sounded a lot like ape vocalizations. Now, another type of friction drum that's also used is known as the lion's roar. Now, you may remember me uh, talking about the origin of the cuica and that it was probably used by the Bantu people as a way to imitate a female lioness. Well, a lion's roar is meant to imitate a male lion. Um, and it's actually a very easy drum to make. Basically, you can take any old tom-tom, floor tom, or even bass drum that may be a little bit beat up, and you could find a new use for it. 
what you do is you take one of the heads, poke a hole through the center, just like on the cuica, and then tie a long rope through that hole and knot it at the end so it won't come through. And then you could uh, rub some either violin rosin or some of that beeswax all over that cord or the rope, and then take something moist, like a moist washcloth or a moist sponge again, and then you just rub it up and down the, uh, the cord, and it will sound like a very low-pitched, scary male lion. There you go. Okay, so now I'd like to get into the more Latin American style hand drums. So first we'll start with one of my favorites. This is called the conga. And it's a very large wooden drum that is actually open-ended, so there's no head on the bottom. And the conga originally comes from Cuba, or as they say in Spanish, Cuba. Um, the exact origins of the conga are a little shady, but most records start to see that it was turning up in Cuban music around the late 19th century. Um, and it is also believed to have uh, been developed by Cubans of African descent. So uh, I mentioned before with the cuica that that was um, developed with ideas brought about by the Bantu slaves. So Cuba also had a slave trade for a while. And once again, we see some of those Bantu ethnic people coming in in the slave trade. And they brought with them their drum ideas. Um, and it's very likely that's where the idea of the conga came from. Um, not too many people are sure of where the name conga actually comes from. There's many different theories. One theory is that perhaps it came from the word Congo, which is uh, a present-day country, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Central Africa, and that's where the Bantu people come from. So that is one explanation. Um, some say that it comes from a rhythm known as La Conga, which is a rhythm that is played during Cuban carnival music. So no one's quite sure, but there, there's a few different theories. That's not really important. What's important is the drum itself. Uh, from the late 19th centuries, uh, late 19th century on, it became a very popular instrument to use in Cuban music. Um, and then it really took off in the 1930s when Cuban music started to sweep across the United States. Um, now, the original name for the conga when it came about was actually tumbadora, but then in the 1930s when Latin American music really started taking off in the United States, that's when we start hearing the name conga more and more. And there was even a style of music called conga. So it's a style of music and it's the name of a drum. And when the Latin American music scene hit New York City, which is still very big today, um, that's when it uh, more and more Puerto Ricans became interested in learning about the conga. So you don't specifically have to be Cuban to be a conga player. Um, these Puerto Rican musicians were very interested and they learned from the Cuban conga players themselves. Uh, so now we start seeing the conga appearing in other types of Latin American music, not just Cuban. So we find it in Cuban music, Puerto Rican music, Mexican music, and even in styles of music that aren't specifically of Latin origin. Um, so the, probably the most popular styles of music that you will find the conga are conga music itself, the conga style, uh, salsa, rumba, merengue, descarga, Afro-Cuban jazz, and even Latin rock, such as the, uh, the Latin rock band Santana. We'll be talking more about them later. Um, now, somebody who's... Um, a conga player is actually referred to as the Spanish word conguero. Okay, so I wanted to discuss the basic uh, strikes that you do on a conga. So first is what we call the bass tone. So that's where I took the entire palm of my hand and just hit it in the center. Then what we have is the open tone, and that's when the fleshy part of your hand hits the rim like this. different kind of sound. And then we have what is called the slap, and that's what you do with your fingertips.
to talk about the conga's smaller cousin. These are known as bongos. Uh, so the nice thing about the conga is that you can play pretty much as many congas as you want. Some people just play one conga, as I was just doing. You can play with two congas of different sizes. Three, I've seen people even play with six congas, all different sizes for different sounds, different tones. But the thing about bongos is that you will always see them as a pair. You will never see one bongo, you will never see three bongos. You will always see just two, and they come uh, stuck together like that. That's the way they're actually designed. And notice that one drum is a little smaller and one is a little larger. Um, so bongos, like congas, also come from Cuba in origin. Uh, once again, the the origin story is a little shady, not too much is known about who developed it exactly, but we start to see it in records of Cuban music from the late 19th century, around the same time as when the conga first appeared. And once again, it's believed to have evolved from ideas brought by the Bantu ethnic people of Central Africa, uh, because they are also open-ended drums just like the conga. Um, so there's been a lot of questions of how you're supposed to actually position the bongos, what side does the smaller drum go on. And there's even some professional players who are not even sure of this. Uh, but I've done some research and found out that the smaller bongo is actually supposed to go on the left side, if you're the player. You, sh you should be seeing the smaller drum on your left. Um, and in Spanish, they actually have names for the two different drums. So the larger drum is known as the hembra, which means female, and the smaller drum is known as the macho, meaning male. And uh, I said before, if you are a conga player, they call you a conguero, and if you are a bongo player in Spanish, they say bongocero. Um, so you will find bongos in uh, pretty much the same styles the, of Latin American music that I mentioned the conga in. Um, at first, that wasn't always the case. They were sort of in different styles, and eventually they kind of came together. So sometimes in like salsa bands and merengue bands, you might be seeing uh, one percussionist who's playing the conga and one next to him who's playing bongos. And in some setups, you might even see one person playing both, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but if you're not using any kind of special bongo stand, the traditional way to play bongos is to actually sit down like I am and you actually put them in between your legs and kind of tighten them with your knees like this. And you play them with the same tapping techniques and slapping techniques that you would with the congo. talking more about Latin American hand drums in just a bit, but first, before we do, I want to talk about another category known as the goblet drums. So this right here, this is a type of goblet drum that comes from Africa. This is called a djembe, and uh, specifically it comes from Western Africa and was most likely developed by the ethnic group, the Mandinka people. Um, nobody's quite sure how old djembes are. There's a theory that they are at least 500 years old. Some people think the design is a thousand years old and some people think it's well over a thousand years old. Nobody's quite sure. Um, but from evidence, uh, evidence of photographs uh, taken during the colonization of Africa, we know that they were there uh, at least by the late 19th century used by the Mandinka tribes. Um, and as you can see from the shape, it has a nice goblet shape. Um, now, the exact origin of the name, it's believed to come from the Mandinka phrase, Anke J, Anke Be, which means everyone gathered together in peace, which was actually the primary purpose of the djembe. If you were a djembe player, which is known as a djembe fola, you would gather in a large circle, which is known as a drum circle, and everybody would play and have a good time and have a lot of, it was a nice little blending of music and peace. <laughs> Um, and 
it's said by the Mandinka people that you know somebody is a skilled djembe player if you can make the djembe talk. And what they mean by that is that you use every part of your hand, every part of the drum itself to come up with all different sounds and tones and whatnot to make sort of a musical story, so to speak. Djembe's actually come in a variety of different sizes. That one I was just using is a smaller size djembe, but here's a larger size djembe. And because this one is a little bit larger, you're going to get a much different tone. So here's a, another type of goblet drum I wanted to talk about. And this is one that I only uh, purchased recently, like in the last year or so. Um, so about a year ago, my wife and I, we went to New York City to see a new Broadway play that was known as The Band's Visit. And uh, it was based on an Israeli film that had been made a few years before. Um, and the story concerns an Egyptian police band that's on their way to a concert in an Israeli city known as Peta Tikva. But due to some confusion at the bus station, they accidentally buy tickets to the similarly sounding village of Beit Hatikva. And when the police band arrive there, they realize they've made a mistake and they find out that they are not able to get a new bus to the correct city until the following morning. So that means they are now stuck in this village that they know nothing about and they are now the guests of these local Israeli people and what happens after that is there's some uh, very humorous situations that take place but ultimately they become very friendly with the village's inhabitants um, but one thing I absolutely loved about this musical was the music itself and <laughs>
So the uh, the actors who played the police band actually were musicians themselves, and they played the music. And I noticed this actor slash musician who played the part of the drummer, he played this instrument that you see right here. So it is a goblet drum, so it has that goblet sort of shape that's very similar to the, uh, the djembe, except this one is Middle Eastern in origin. This one is called a dumbek. Some people call it a darbuka. It has a variety of different names, but those are probably the two most well-known names. Uh, it's believed that the name darbuka derives from the Arabic word darba, which means to strike. So this is an instrument that you will see in, in, in here in many different Middle Eastern ensembles. Uh, whether it's from Egypt or Turkey or Israel or Iraq, various places like that. And it's also a very old style of drum. There is evidence from artwork that suggests that this style of drum existed in ancient civilizations such as ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, Babylonia, Sumer, even the ancient Israelites most likely used this drum. Um, so it is not made of wood, like the uh, like the djembe, but actually the this kind is made out of metal. This is actually made out of copper. This particular one is was made in Turkey, and we have a, a synthetic drum head on the top. And you actually do not play it like a djembe with it in between your legs. You actually put it underneath your arm and on your leg and play it like so. Now some hand drummers will actually use special stands to create a sort of hand drum drum set. They can have multiple hand drums at their disposal. So as you can see, um, we have two sizes of congas here. We have a set of bongos and we also have a large size djembe. So uh, you will see a lot of players playing these like hand drum setups like this in a uh, Afro-Cuban jazz settings, and also in Latin rock band settings, just like the band Santana. notice is that quite a few of the instruments that I played today have the brand LP on them. So LP is actually a percussion company. Uh, it stands for Latin Percussion and they make several types of hand drums, um, auxiliary percussion, and other various types of ethnic instruments. And it's a very widely used company. So if you're serious about becoming a hand drummer yourself, Here's a compilation I put together of some of the greatest hand drummers around in the music business for you to check out. But you don't have to take my word for it.
Thanks for joining us today. Now, there was one last Latin American drum that we didn't get to today, which is known as a cajon, but I've decided that there are so many things to talk about with this instrument, I've decided to uh, devote an entire episode to just the cajon, so we'll see that some other time. Until then, see you on the next episode of Percussion 101 with Mr. Lupoli.